I'm going to introduce you straight away to the course tutor, who is Dr. William Davis. William Davis is a consultant psychologist and head of applied clinical psychology at the Association for Psychological Therapies, APT. Courses written by him have been studied by well over 100,000 mental health professionals, meaning that his input will, at a conservative estimate, have influenced interventions with well over 1 million people. So for more information, see Wikipedia William Davis Psychologist. So Will, it is all yours. Well, welcome everybody and thank you very much for coming on Christmas Eve Eve. And we have got a lot to cover. So let's have a look. This slide is about the scope of uh, the, the hour. Um, I'm afraid I'm, I'm worried we're not going to get through it all in an hour, actually. So if that doesn't happen, then you can have, a, Amy says, you can have a, a full refund. So, um, but we're going to cover higher order factors like relationships, our biology, uh, what we do, our behavior in, in, a, in a life and so on. And the thing is that these, all these factors apply across the board. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about depression, anxiety, psychosis, most mental health problems, these will apply across the board. So that's this kind of setup. That's what we're trying to do. The rationale is fairly straightforward. I was, I was looking on, uh, on the web and um, on Amazon, and there's four and a half thousand books about mental health. I thought that can't be right, can it? Can't be, we can't actually need four and a half thousand books to, to lead a kind of rewarding, straightforward, enjoyable life, can we? That can't be right. My thinking is that um, you, you can't, uh, it can't be a complicated thing. So we need to look at simple things. It's, uh, if things are not simple in the mental health arena, I think we need to have an alarm bell ringing. It cannot be complicated. We can't be designed that way. But we are going to cover a lot of things. So they're all simple, but there will be a lot of things there. So there will be things, I'm sure, that anybody will you'll want to make a note of and say, well, I'll address that after the hour. I will actually work on that. Uh, maybe look at uh, looking things up and working on that one. Equally, though, I think it's nice to make a note of the things you know you are doing very well already, because otherwise it's a bit depressing just to note down the things you're not doing well. So note down the things that you're doing well on as well, I suggest, and see how that, uh, see how that pans out. Right, now, um, we've got eight sections to cover. One is about behavior, what we do. Next one is about biology, how, uh, how our biology affects us. Next one is about people and indeed pets. Fourthly, the environment, the effect of the environment on us and how we can adjust the environment. Number five, our own mental activity, what goes on inside our head. Number six, however well we do things, we will be distressed from time to time. So we need to look at responding to distress, how best to respond to distress. Number seven, untreatable problems. What happens when, if we have a mental health problem that is literally untreatable, what, uh, what's the best thing to do then? And finally, uh, a Q&A session. So you can write down in, the, in, the, in chat any questions you want. When we come to that se section, perhaps, uh, write down any questions you want. And Amy will kind of uh, have a look at them, uh, judge what are the good questions to, uh, to ask, and put them to me, and I'll do my best to answer them. Now, we're going to, I'm going to have a go at doing a poll, because it'd be nice to be a little bit interactive, even though there's a lot of us. Um, Everyone's already started. We're already getting votes in the chat box. Oh, really? Well, I'm going <laughs> to... Yeah, I'm afraid so. I'm going to launch a poll. There we go. Oh. Yeah. So, um, there's a poll being launched, and you can, you can only give one, I think. You only vote for one, I think. Which one are we going to start with? So what should we do next, it says. In other words, which should we start with? Oh, that's the way. So vote away, everybody. Uh, read, read it through. Take your time. I won't, uh, I won't stop it until you've had a chance to do it. So read through. Take your time. And it's very, you can't see it, but it's very interesting at this end. The uh, little, little graphs are coming up of uh, which one's coming first and so on. Uh, oh, gosh. Looks like there's quite a clear winner. Oh, really? Well, it's still, it's still moving. Okay, yeah. Which one do you reckon is winning? The what to do, how to lessen displacement? How to, 
Okay. Yeah, how to lessen distress when we get distressed. And that was looked like the winner in the chat as well. So that's good. Oh, really? Okay. All right then. All right. End polling. Uh, sh oh, share results. So we don't need to share results. For Amy has announced it for sure. Yeah, sorry. I got excited. <laughs> Responding to distress. Okay, let's let's click here and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Nothing. <laughs> Yes, it does. That's good. Okay, responding to distress. And the idea here is that uh, no matter how good we are, how good a life we lead, how clever we are inside our heads and so on, there will be times when we get distressed. So what are we going to do then? Number one, two, and three is mindfulness. I think mindfulness is just amazing. I know everybody has heard of mindfulness and some people are very good at mindfulness. But it is remarkable. And if you look where it features, it features in DBT, in acceptance and commitment therapy, in compassion focus therapy. And you begin to wonder, well, is this this sort of active ingredient uh, across so many therapies? I don't think it is, actually. I think it's one of the active ingredients, but it uh, is certainly one of the active ingredients. And even by itself, it is quite remarkable. And it's particularly good um, when, when you're distressed. And uh, why is that? Because there are two particular components to it. One is mindfulness meditation. To learn to do mindfulness meditation, and we'll look how to do that in a second. To learn to do that is terrific, because it almost like reboots the system. It's like switching yourself off and then switching yourself back on again in a few minutes. Mindfulness meditation is fantastic. But the second one is equally or even more fantastic. And that is the ability to observe, to, to, to observe, describe, and observe non-judgmentally. And that comes in, I mean, you can observe anything you like non-judgmentally. You can observe the sound of the traffic outside non-judgmentally. You can uh, observe the uh, noisy people going down the corridor non-judgmentally. You can observe anything you like. But in mental health, it's particularly important because what happens typically is that when people get depressed, for example, or anxious or anything else, when they get depressed, for example, they get distressed that they are depressed. So it's doubly bad. In fact, it's more than doubly bad. It's bad enough being depressed. But once you get distressed that you're depressed, you get more depressed. And then you get more distressed that you're de depressed. And you go around in a spiral or down in a spiral very, very quickly indeed. So it's that second arrow, that spiral, that really, uh, really uh, undermines people terrifically. So once you learn how to observe non-judgmentally, say, oh, I'm in a bout of depression again, okay, full stop. And that's bad enough, but it's not nearly as bad as entering the spiral. And that's what observing things non-judgmentally does for you. So when you're distressed, meditate, mindfulness, in both in terms of meditation and the observing non-judgmentally, absolutely very good indeed. Now, people will will say, uh, if you know all about mindfulness, you may say, well, there's lots more to mindfulness than that. And you would be absolutely right, there is. But those two things for me are the two major things. So if you want to um, uh, learn about mindfulness meditation, search online for Mark Williams, that's the author, Mark Williams, he's really good. And his publisher is Penguin Random House. Penguin Random House. So if you search online for Mark Williams Penguin Random House, and I bet probably Mark Williams Penguin will do it too, um, what, uh, what happens is you get uh, a whole host. It's actually eight different mindfulness meditations. They're all free. Uh, Penguin Random House uh, provide them completely free. And they are as good meditations as you can possibly get. They are absolutely top. He has a very good voice for it. He doesn't put on a special voice. He's got a natural good voice to do it. And it's very, very good. Completely free. If you're in North America, then John Kabat-Zinn, he's extremely good. He, he brought um, mindfulness from the, uh, from, the, from the Eastern traditions over, to, uh, over to, the, to the West, if you like. So he originated it. And he's, he does it extremely well, too. And equally, there's some fantastic stuff on Headspace and similar apps like that. So there's uh, some terrific mindfulness uh, meditations about. Okay, um, 
Right out. Oh, uh, just to just to uh, repeat what Amy said, really. Uh, chat at any time you like. Put uh, any questions or comments or observations or experiences in chat, and make sure it goes to everybody. Really, well, unless you want to, particularly to come to me and Amy, make sure you know, the little, little arrow by where you type in. Uh, put uh, all panelists and attendees, and it will come to everybody. And then you get people answering you and so on, which is very nice. But in terms of uh, uh, operating and responding to distress when you are distressed, mindfulness, I suggest, is possibly number one. It's not the only thing, though. Marsha Linehan in DBT has some um, very good, uh, very good uh, exercises for this. Um, distress tolerance is her uh, is her thing. Is one of her things. And one of the things she lists under distress tolerance, and my favorite of them, is exercise, like, as in physical exercise, as in and she, she advises intense, short burst of physical exercise. I always feel nervous, to be honest, advising people to take an intense, short burst of physical exercise because I worry about them damaging themselves and uh, ending up in hospital or something. But this is what she says. And I have to say, just a little bit of self-disclosure for me, what I do is, uh, uh, is my short burst of physical exercise is to uh, walk up, uh, it's actually over 100 steps, it's 105 steps, two at a time, as quickly as I can. And uh, that, that is quite exercisey for me. And it doesn't take very long. It's not a, not a long thing to do, but it's, uh, it's really good. It actually puts a pause in you in the same way as mindfulness. It's a bit like rebooting the system, putting a pause in the system. This does exactly the same. So exercise is, I think, a very good one. But there's also the concept of soothing. Now, it's, a, it's an important concept. And uh, Paul Gilbert, for example, in Compassion Focused Therapy, has written a book called Compassion Focused Therapy. And Paul Gilbert is the main name in Compassion Focused Therapy. He is very good on soothing. And he talks about um, the research, which shows that when one person is soothed by another one in particular, so for example, if you soothe your children, when they are distressed, if you manage to soothe them in some way, it is like uh, it actually nurtures the neurons in the brain. It develops the brain. So his phrase is that soothing is like vitamins for the brain. So you can soothe other people, that's brilliant. And if you can soothe yourself, that's even more brilliant. And you say, well, how do I soothe myself then? Well, that's uh, uh, not so easy. But it, if uh, you can contact, if you know somebody is very good at soothing you, you can contact them, phone them up, email them, text them, whatever it is. If you know things that actually soothe you, like uh, having a bath, listening to music, going for a stroll around the, uh, around the streets, uh, or whatever, uh, anything like that, people find, some people find soothing, different, different people find different things soothing. But once you find one thing that you find soothing, make a note of it. Once you find another thing, add it to the list. And before you know it, you will have a short menu of soothing things. And to soothe yourself is brilliant. Some people find massages soothing and so on. So but that's the concept. Work out how to soothe yourself and importantly to soothe other people. Lastly, I think, if I remember rightly, is a concept of distraction. And that is a very simple one. Immerse yourself in anything you find absorbing. If I were to ask you, what do you find absorbing? You might say um, a particular TV program, a particular music, uh, baking, uh, uh, running, whatever. There are certain things you will find uh, absorbing, um, crosswords, whatever. Uh, whatever you find absorbing, deliberately immerse yourself in that. Before you do that, make sure that whatever it is that's distressing you, it doesn't actually need addressing. Some things do need addressing. For example, if you are about to sit an exam tomorrow and you're distressed at the prospect of having to do that, then distraction is not a good idea. What you need to do is to address the matter in hand. In other words, to do some work for the exam tomorrow. 
don't do distraction. So, so long as it doesn't need addressing, so long as the distressing factor doesn't need addressing, distraction is brilliant. And it's a good question to ask yourself, does whatever's distressing me, does that need addressing? And once you've answered no, that in itself is quite reassuring, but go on, move on and use distraction if you wish. So you, so you now have a menu, and I think Amy is about to burst in. I can sense somehow that Amy is about to burst in, but uh, which is nice. Um, uh, but you now have a menu uh, of responding to distress. Uh, and here it is. So you can tick off or have a look at any one of those that you need to work on. And I suggest you make a note of ones you're good at already. Practice mindfulness. Take a short burst of exercise. Get good, good at soothing yourself and others. And immerse yourself in things that absorb you, so long as the matter in hand doesn't actually need addressing. Okay, that's the end of that section. Just a couple of quick things. There's a, a, a couple of nice um, ideas for mindfulness um, exercises and books in the chat. Okay. So um, Coralie was wondering about individuals who haven't experienced soothing, particularly those who've had a traumatic childhood. Have you got any ideas for what they should do? Um, well, um, the same thing as applies to all of these, I'm afraid, that we, we're going to cover a lot of boxes to tick or not tick. And what you'll find is that some of the boxes you can't tick. You say, well, sadly, you know, my experience is such and such, so I cannot tick that box. And the good news is that's not the end of the world. You don't have to be able to tick all the boxes to lead a rewarding life. Obviously, in a sense, the more you can tick, the better it is. But the idea that you have to be able to tick them all is uh, not, not the case, fortunately. The other thing is that uh, a lot of people have had very unfortunate uh, childhoods and adulthoods indeed. But uh, the, what's happened in the past is not necessarily a guide to what's going to happen in the future. And simply because no one has ever soothed us in the past, and we've never learned to soothe ourselves in the past, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to uh, persist either tomorrow or any time. Tomorrow we may come across people who can soothe us, especially if we uh, uh, gently um, put it to them that we're a bit uh, worried at the moment or a bit uh, miserable at the moment or whatever. That makes sense? Yep, super. And a nice couple of ideas for immersing activities such as knitting or writing books. Yes, knitting is a big one, isn't it? And I think things that you do with your hands are really, really important. Cross stitch, strangely enough, I don't really know what cross stitch is, but that seems to come up a lot as a really good thing, cross stitch. Uh, yeah, I want to say oh. reading books as well. And um, um, writing books. Writing books, yes. Yeah. yes. That's a nice one because the act of writing, a lot of people find uh, soothing. The idea that the book has to be a good book, it's not really the case. Yeah, it can be, but it uh, doesn't have to be. The act of writing itself, yeah. Okay? Yep, yeah, perfect. Okay. Let's go back to our thing then. Launch a poll. So what should we do next? Uh, Relaunch poll, okay. I'm uh, enjoying your menu. Uh, it's good, isn't it? Yeah, really nice. Okay, the poll is relaunched. What should we do next? Oh, it's coming in. Yep, we can see we can see what's happening here. So uh, don't don't rush. Just uh, as quick as as whenever you like, go in and say what you think. Most of people could see this because it's quite fun, isn't it? It is fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> I don't think people can see it until we end the polling, and then it's then it's yeah, ended. Yeah. It's a bit like, um, you know, Strictly. Uh, okay, I reckon there's a winner, James. What do you think? Yep, a super duper clear winner. Controlling our mental activity for the best. Oh, golly. Okay, let's find it. Here we are, mental activity. Here we go. Okay, in we go to mental activity. Right, well, this is a fascinating one, I think, mental activity, because, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, it's always the cognitive things that uh, professionals, mental health professionals, they always love the cognitive things, the mental things. My experience is that patients love the behavioral things. Even so, there's some fantastic mental things we can do. So let's have a look what uh, we might look at in mental activity. 
The idea of treading good neural circuits in the brain, treading good neural circuits. Um, now, it's, it's, let me just take this in a slightly different order from what I wrote it in. Well, no, why not? The African experience. There's a, um, there's, uh, there's a story I was listening to the other day, and there's a Western psychologist who was in Africa, in a village in Africa. And he was investigating because a lot of the mental health uh, practices in Africa are really convincing. They really work very well. The results are uh, you know, just uh, uh, amazing. So he'd gone to have, have a look. And he said, in this village, if, when somebody was depressed, what happened was they were, you know, everyone met outside and the person who was depressed was uh, in the middle of the circle and everyone danced around with uh, you know, good good wishes and wonderful. And they were encouraged to dance and it's sunny and bright and lovely music and so on and so forth. And this worked pretty well. And he would say, oh, that's not what we do in the, in the West. Uh, and they said, no, we had some Western psychologists over and we had to get rid of them, I'm afraid. And uh, he said, well, why is that? He said, well, what they did was they would take the person into a, into a small room and talk to them about all the bad things that had happened to them in the past and all the things that were worrying them at the moment. And uh, everyone got uh, you know, really not liking this. So they had to, um, had to go back home again. And I thought, well, put that way, it does put a sort of different perspective on, on what we do. And they think, oh, well, that's oversimplifying what we do. Well, perhaps it is, but there's a lot of truth in it as well. And then uh, I put together the, that with another thing. There's, there's a book called, at the bottom of this list, there's a book called The Organization of Behavior by Donald Hebb. And this is a most remarkable book because it's written about 1950. And it is about the most popular uh, and read book that ever has been, so much so that even though Don Hebb died years ago, I think it was around about 1990-something he died, you can still buy this book. It's still being reprinted to this day. And a lot of the, one of these things that really sort of strike me evidence-wise are these things that are, um, they, they stand the test of time, you know. And this is one that stood the test of time big time. And what Don Hebb talks about is neural circuits in the brain. And of course, that is, that is that's, not a, that's not a metaphor. There really are neural circuits in the brain. There's uh, sets of neurons that fire together, uh, associated with memories and experiences and feelings and so on. So what he says is you need to uh, retread good circuits. And it's like, it's like retreading a path through a rainforest. The more often you tread it, the easier it is to tread that path. So the more often you run this a, a good neuronal circuit, the easier it is for that neuronal circuit to run. Equally, neural circuits that have a bad effect on you, maybe don't run those so often. Don't really reminisce and dwell and brood about all the bad things that happen too much. Allow those, unless you need to address them in some way, Allow them to grow over if that's possible to do. Allow them to slowly grow over with time. So that's um, that's what established that. And of course, it fits in with um, with what we might do. What makes what simple things make sense? To remember nice things that have happened. To discuss nice things that have happened. To uh, talk to other people about nice things that have happened. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Why would you want to talk about nasty things that have happened? I know we are, um, you know, we're told that uh, you know, it's, it's good to talk and so on, yeah, but I'm sure it, um, it might be. But uh, the original thing that said it's good to talk, that was of course an advertisement for, for British Telecom. It wasn't anything to do with mental health. It was BT, wasn't it? Remember BT from British Telecom? She featured in this advert and the slogan was, it's good to talk. Well, it is and it isn't. It depends what you're talking about. So, uh, and listen to music that stimulates good circuits. In other words, has a good effect on you. It's fantastic these days with Spotify and all the other streaming services. You can actually have, um, you can have all, all the different um, playlists that you want. And I urge you to have one that is called, um, has a good effect on me. Music that has a good effect on me for whatever reason. You can have other playlists of all sorts, but I urge you to have one that says, has a good effect on me. And don't think too much about it. Just put tracks there that have a good effect on you. 
when we were having um, uh, music wars before the before the thing started, before the uh, hour started, I'd put my music on and Amy put hers on and so on. The music that I'd put on was from my playlist of uh, music that has a good effect on me. And one that came up was uh, Ralph McTell, uh, The Streets of London. And I, and I was listening to it, I thought, this is slightly bizarre, isn't it? It's kind of miserable, miserable song. But it has a good effect on it. It makes me feel good for some perverse reason. I don't know why. Uh, and I don't want to think about it. It has a good effect on me. So into the, into the, into the uh, playlist it goes. And I urge you to have to do the same thing for you. Don't try and justify it. Just do it. Likewise, films. Some, sometimes people are reluctant to watch a film for the second or the third time. Other people, they will uh, do exactly that. They'll watch films that have a good effect on them. And books, rereading books that have a good effect on you and so on. So in summary, tread good neural circuits. That's a great simple thing to do. Annie's asked if good neural circuits are just memories or are there other examples of good neural circuits? Oh, good question. Uh, it, it's, uh, well, they can be memories, but it can be more than memories. So it can be a memory associated with a feeling. And um, oh, just to go back to another, um, another, another track, it's playing uh, Bridge Over Troubled Water. Well, that's, and I, I thought, well, this doesn't have a good effect on me. This isn't having a good effect. And I thought, well, why not? Because there's good memories associated with it. So why isn't it having a good effect on me? Don't know. There'll be other things, there'll be certain other feelings creeping in from somewhere that means it's not. So in answer to the question, yeah, it's memories and feelings, uh, memories and feelings really, uh, all melded together. And Ellen has asked if scents that make you feel good, like um, infusers or air brilliant 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 yes very very much so because the, uh, the the that's very powerful it really gets to the uh, really gets to the core of things yeah yeah uh, conversely though having talked about you know oh, do do all of these things that make you feel good and so on uh, terrific but some things do need to be addressed and problem solving under uh, you know, mental activities Problem solving is a really core one. It, it features strongly in CBT and DBT, and it is a core skill to get good at. Um, you've got to address some things. Now, there is a sequence, and it's a simple sequence. You write down, you, once you've written down a problem, once you know what the problem is, you write down all the possible options. You really think, and you get other people to help you, if you like, to write down numerous, numerous options. So you know that you have written down all the possible options. Then you go through them and write down the pros and cons of those options. That's a good thing to do. And that activates the thinking brain, the cerebral cortex. That's activated a particular part of your brain to evaluate the pros and cons. And number three, you choose the one you fancy, probably the ones you fancy. Some problems have more than one solution to them as a kind of pack of solutions. So uh, that way, what you get is a balanced, uh, almost like a wise mind judgment. You activate, activated the cerebral cortex, looking at the pros and cons, very thoughtful. And then you choose the one you fancy. Uh, just, uh, it's just, uh, uh, just literally that. And it doesn't always make sense, but it's, uh, but it's coming from the you know, different part of the brain, the limbic system, actually. So that's, and that's what happens. Just a, a silly little example. I might, if we've got time, I give you a serious example, but a silly little example is a friend of mine is, is evaluating the pros and cons. He's trying to choose between a BMW 3 Series. He needed a new car, trying to choose between a BMW 3 Series and a Vauxhall Vectra. And he's looking at all the, um, all the pros and cons. And you get all sorts of things. You have a room there was in the back seat, uh, top speed, fuel economy, all sorts of things. And he wrote down all the pros and cons of one and the other. And strangely enough, well, depending on what you know about cars or think about cars, the one that came out better on most of the factors was the Vauxhall Vectra. So what did he do then? He went off and bought the BMW. And why was that? Well, he said, that's the one he fancied. He looked at all the pros and cons, the Vectra won on most of the factors, but he just fancied the BMW. And that's, uh, it sounds a little bit strange and kind of wrong way around, but no, that's, that's exactly what you do. Once you've activated the one part of the brain, looked at the pros and cons, then you can do the one you fancy.
uh, and it's a wise mind decision, very strangely. The uh, uh, serious, serious example was um, uh, someone I know who he got into serious financial trouble, so much so that uh, the bank was repossessing his house, was about to repossess his house. And he was talking about, he was talking about uh, the, the fact that they were overspending. Uh, they, had, um, uh, they had children at fee paying schools and they had this expensive house. So in terms of what, what could happen is they could take the children out of school. So they stopped having to um, uh, spend so much money on school fees. They could uh, uh, spend less, you know, be a bit more um, uh, whatever it is, careful with their spending and so on. Uh, and in the end, what did he do? He sold the house and moved to a much, much, much smaller house. And he said, well, I'm not sure I'd have done that. Uh, doesn't matter. He looked at the pros and cons and he chose the one he fancied doing. So it, it suited him. And he looked carefully at all the pros and cons and uh, that's, the one he, uh, that's the one he went for. So the solution isn't always a good solution. He wasn't delighted to be selling his house, but there again, neither was he with any of the other options. So uh, and it's the best available option is what you go for. Be compassionate to yourself. Now, again, this is from uh, Paul Gilbert uh, in Compassion Focused Therapy. And what he shows, what he demonstrates is that we can do all the best things. We can uh, do uh, wonderful distress tolerance ideas, wonderful mental things, wonderful behavioral things, but none of it works. And certainly it doesn't work so well unless you sort of treat yourself with compassion, as he puts it. So you can be very harsh on yourself and tell yourself to you know, take some exercise because I'm distressed, I've got to take some exercise. It just won't work because you're being too harsh on yourself. You have to do it in a compassionate frame of mind if you're going to, if it's going to work. So be compassionate to yourself. And there's various phrases and concepts we use in, in this regard. Uh, in, in IPT, in interpersonal psychotherapy, which is incredibly effective actually, interpersonal psychotherapy, the, the, um, the evidence for it is uh, stunning. So, but what, one of the things they do there is they give the patient the sick role you say, look, uh, you are suffering from depression. It's a serious illness, and uh, you must look after yourself while you have depression, and uh, we'll help you look after yourself and uh, get through it and recover. So the patient has the sick role, and they, they treat themselves as though they are ill. That tends to go against the grain for psychologists, but that's what happens in interpersonal psychotherapy. And... Uh, the concept we tend to use in CBT, for example, is the idea of being your own best friend, advising yourself as though you are your own best friend, uh, giving yourself ideas as though you wanted to really help and be warm to your best friend. And another concept that I like particularly is actually my favorite, is to treat yourself as though you are recuperating from an illness. And you know, if you were recuperating from an illness, you would treat yourself rather gently and you know, with kid gloves and look after yourself uh, particularly well. Uh, I, I like that idea very much. And I would say to people, treat yourself as though you are recuperating from an illness. And that seems to it be the, or, or recovering, if you prefer the word recovering, and people seem to be able to sort of grasp that as a concept uh, and go with that. But the overall concept, the idea you're trying to get across to the person is to be compassionate to themselves. Compassion is normally people think in terms of being compassionate to other people. So the getting, getting across the idea of being compassionate to yourself can be slightly a slightly tricky one. But if you can be, whatever else you do works 50% or 100% better. I'm not exaggerating with 100% because some things simply don't work unless you are compassionate to yourself. So it transforms it. Okay, so that is that section. And again, have a look what you can tick off, but have a look what you would like to work on. Remembering nice things, talking about nice things, discussing nice things. So you run your good circuits. Listen to music that stimulates your good circuits. Likewise, films. And yes, very much so. Somebody mentioned uh, fragrances, very much so. Fragrances linger incredibly well in the memory too. They really uh, produce circuits like that. You can remember smells from uh, years and years ago. 
when you have a problem, try to solve it rather than dwelling and brooding. You know, rather than sort of just dwelling and brooding on things, actually address the problem. Some things do actually need addressing. And when they do, it's right to address them. So um, try to solve it. Problem solving, terrific strategy. And number three, treat yourself with compassion. To me, those are the three top mental activity things. There's a whole host of things under mental activity we could look at. But I would suggest those three as three front runners. By all means, though, do put in chat if you think, oh, well, what about, you know, um, um, logical evidence-based reasoning, for example. Another good one. There's quite a few really good ones about. Okay. Um, how are we doing, Ames? That's the end of that section. We uh, Anything we need to talk about, or can we go and launch another poll? No, I think we should launch another poll. Great. Yeah. Okay. There's our menu. Let's have a poll. Uh, relaunch polling. Uh, okay, there it goes. Take your time. You won't, you won't, you won't shut it until, until you're done, until it all settles down. Uh, 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 okay, oh, it's coming through nicely. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Take your time. Are you ready if I do the deed? Do the deed. Okay, and the winner is our behaviour and the importance of what we do. Blimey, blimey, it's a big section this. <laughs> Rightly, it's a big section. There it is, behaviour. There's a child behaving with his plane, playing. There we go. Well, yes, behaviour is rightly a huge section. And if you look at uh, all sorts of people, psychologists, philosophers and all sorts, they've had a lot to say about behavior because behavior, you know, life is what happens while we are busy making other plans, said John Lennon. Great quote. Unfortunately, it appeared in Reader's Digest in 1957, apparently, but let's gloss over that. I like John Lennon uh, version better. Same version, but you know. Um, so yes, behavior, that really is life. Our life is what we do. So let's have a look at some of the key concepts that have that have come out. Viktor Frankl talked about meaning. He he wrote uh, his most famous book was uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Viktor Frankl and his wife were a young Jewish couple uh, at the outbreak of the Second World War, and they lived in uh, Austria, I think, actually. But they um, but they got sent to um, uh, concentration camps. They were separated and sent to concentration camps. And sadly, uh, Mrs. Frankel didn't, didn't survive the war. Viktor Frankl, who was a psychiatrist and um, remained a psychiatrist afterwards, he did survive, but he saw a lot of people, a lot of people die and a lot of people survive as well. And what he found interesting was uh, what was the difference? And he says that the people who found a, a meaning in what they were enduring and a meaning in life in general, they were the ones that survived. And those who found no meaning in what they were going through or no meaning in life, they were the ones less likely to survive. And his book, Man's Search for Meaning, became a you know, bestseller and has in, endured, its effect has endured forever. So the key, the key um, idea there is not that life in itself has a meaning for everybody, and every, everybody's life has the same meaning, but that each of us can find a meaning to our own lives. So for example, Viktor Frankl said that his meaning had become to, uh, to convey this idea to as many people as he could do. Um, he, he's long, long since died, but that's the idea has persisted to this day and, and then some. So you might say, well, okay, what sort of thing are we talking about then? What sort of meaning? Well, your meaning may be to, uh, to look after your family or to look after your parents or your children or your family of whatever sort. It may be to, uh, to do your job as well as you can. Uh, it may be to have as good a time as you can in life. Uh, it may be to be as good a friend as you can to other people. It doesn't have to be a noble meaning. It can so perfectly well be to have as good a time as you, as you possibly can. 
but whatever the whatever it is it's the meaning for you so that was uh frankel's idea and it's a very one that's persisted next concept i want to look at is the idea of having values and principles friedrich nietzsche talked about creating one's one's own goals and values our own goals and values and thereby live authentically and powerfully and again he he died around about 1900 he lived to about 55 about 1845 to 1900 was friedrich nietzsche but that concept is very much a current one and it's been reinvigorated in particular by stephen hayes in acceptance and commitment therapy who says virtually exactly the same thing that we have to uh, have to identify our values and principles and live proactively by them is his phrase well, any advice on how we can direct people to find their me meaning or um values well if we just talk yes we just talk about values and yes okay let's look at values which is slightly different from meaning so if we address values and principles first um i think one of the nicest ideas is if uh, if you think of yourself uh, it's always best to think of yourself i think and then think in terms of having your next big birthday once covid's all over and there's a nice big birthday party for you and you are just turning you know 30 40 50 or you know whatever and um there's a nice big birthday party and somebody's going to stand up and say wonderful things about you and you're wondering what they're going to say and you say, I hope they say X, Y, and Z. What will X, Y, and Z be? Well, they're going to be your values and principles. And but that's the way to put it into something you can actually imagine. Um, yeah, you can you, know, you say, well, I hope they say, um, I'm, always, I'm always there for people when people need help. Uh, I hope they say, do you know, I've never known them tell an untruth. Uh, or whatever it is, they uh, and whatever your ideas would be, but to imagine that thing that uh, that someone's about to make a speech about you at your at your party, what do you hope they're going to say about you? That uh, uncovers very often your values and your principles. Another another thing that um, people say, and this is not quite so nice, I don't think. Say, what would you like put on your gravestone, on your tombstone, your gravestone? And okay, that's uh, that's uh, that's an idea too. It also uh, targets your values and principles. What what would be the key things that people who know you uh, sort of thought were your best attributes? So those would be the two ways of um, working out your values and principles. I suggest. Third way, of course, is to just ask yourself: Well, what are, what are my values and principles? And to spend two, three, four days sort of going through life wondering this. And suddenly one occurs to you and then another one occurs to you. And it's a bit like seeing minnows in a stream. At first, you don't see any at all. But once you've seen one, you see them all. So that's values and principles. Meaning, uh, the, I, I'm not sure I can go any further than the examples I gave. You know, the examples of uh, meaning might be to have a good, uh, have a good time in life. Uh, to look after one's family, uh, to do one's job as well as we possibly can do, uh, and so on. Those are the kind of meanings that so that people come up with. Sounds good to me. Okay. The third concept I want to look at is eudaimonia. Eudaimonia, and it's uh, Aristotle's concept. Now, this so he this is uh, this is not the latest idea then because he was um, about three or 400 years BC. So this is whatever it is, 2,400 years old. Uh, however, it is a current concept and you will find people writing their PhDs on eudaimonia right now. And it's translated as happiness. And I don't think it's a particularly good uh, translation, to be honest. It's more, li more, more likely translated, should be translated as uh, the route to happiness. Because uh, Aristotle, interestingly, is often described as the most intelligent person who ever lived. So I think it's nice to sort of ponder what, uh, what he had to say. 
had an advantage to be fair. He was you know, tutored by uh, Plato, wasn't he? And who in turn was tutored by Socrates. So he had an advantage, but nevertheless, he's often billed as the, uh, the most intelligent person who ever lived and the most useful philosopher. And what he said, the route to happiness is this. First thing you do is you find out what you're good at. That can be one thing or it can be several things. Second thing you do is to do that thing or those things as well as you possibly can. And thirdly, you do that thing or those things lots. And that was it. And I apologize to all those people doing their PhDs on eudaimonia. I know there's more to it than that, but it really does, you will agree, I'm sure, actually boil down to pretty much that, doesn't it? So, um, so there we are. Those three things. Now that is that is um, really neat, I think. Now I have to say, without sort of uh, boasting about the APT, uh, at at the APT, he said about to boast about the APT. Um, at the APT in the headquarters office, we have uh, seven people. I'm one. Amy's another. There's seven of us all together at HQ, uh, and um, everybody there is exactly in their right slot. You know, Amy is uh, busy out there talking to people and so on. I'm hiding away, writing courses and looking at courses and so forth. Uh, the person who does the uh, person who does the registration, she is absolutely perfect for doing a registration. The perfect the person who does the uh, the website and the marketing is absolutely wonderful at doing the website and marketing, and it just everybody is just absolutely in their perfect slots. And that is following exactly this principle. Find what you're good at, do it as well as you can, do it lots. It's a, it's, I have to say, you may be picking up that this is my favorite principle. Okay, here's hedonism. Hedonism. Uh, now, this is the idea of, again, it's a, it's a Greek, goes back to the Greeks. But Jeremy Bentham, the guy who founded UCL, University College London, he said this, he said, nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what we shall do. So he wasn't into you know, ethics beyond that. Well, this was ethics to him. He was uh, uh, the greatest good for the greatest number. He phrased it slightly better than that. But basically, the greatest good for the greatest number was uh, it was something that he kind of uh, initiated. So um, the idea of hedonism, getting pleasure, and that being the meaning and the soul meaning, if you like, uh, was, was something that uh, has been advocated since the days of the ancient Greeks. And to this day, we're going to look at CBT in a minute, which will look at, we'll look at this in a different way. We've got pictures of horses there, uh, obviously, and uh, they're there because horses simply love running for no good reason they just love running and that's why we've trained them to run against each other to see which ones can run the fastest because naturally they just love running you see them in a field they just get up and run to no good reason so yes but hedonism the research on hedonism, hedonism is interesting because uh well i don't know speak for myself perhaps when i was when i was young i thought that hedonism was it you know just how do you get pleasure and obviously the more pleasure you get the happier you're going to get that's obvious turns out not to be true and all the um, all the good research that people have done shows that hedonism is an important element actually but people who sim simply go for hedonism just simply people who target happiness don't end up very happy whereas if you pay attention to the kind of concepts we've been looking at uh, so far and uh, guide yourself largely by those concepts, then to have good pleasures and fun and so forth is really the icing on the cake. In other words, it works really well then. It just fits in perfectly. So um, it, it definitely has its place, but on its own, just, just the icing is no good. You need the cake as well. Okay, well, let's have a look then, talking of hedonism, let's have a look at CBT, because CBT, if any of you has gone and had CBT, and those of you who uh, teach CBT or deliver CBT, you'll know that diary keeping is one of the key things. 
And one of the key elements of, uh, of diary keeping is to have two columns. What you're doing, your behavior, and your mood. So your mood perhaps is being measured on a 10 point scale and your behavior is what you're doing. So I've filled in a couple of entries here. Mood, seven out of 10. What they're doing, playing Fortnite. Mood, three out of 10. What are they doing? Watching TV. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? So what would you advise this person to spend more time doing? Well, if they're interested in enhancing their mood and getting their mood to the highest level, probably, yeah, play more Fortnite and less TV watching. That would probably be right, wouldn't it? And it's those kind of insights that, uh, that uh, diary keeping like this deliver. Those kind of insights are very good. I didn't realise you were so into Fortnite, Well, You know me, Fortnite. <laughs> What, and are you impressed? I've spelt it correctly as well. I know. It's what you've been doing. <laughs> so, but, uh, but, you know, but I guess even as we even as we say that, I, I guess people are thinking, well, that's, there's more to it than that, and, and and so there is. You might say to someone, well, okay, look, obviously Fortnite is your thing. Spend your entire life playing Fortnite. What do you think will happen? Uh, it's not going to work very well. And uh, we'll have a look at why in a moment. But we just know it won't. It's even though we've got a seven out of 10 rating, which is quite high. Most people settle for seven out of 10. Uh, it's, uh, it just won't work very well. Let's have a look why not. But just before we leave though, diary keeping is fantastic for uh, insights. Because people are very interested in rating their mood. They might have an eight out of 10, a two out of 10. And then they're very interested to see what they're doing or thinking about in the left-hand column when they've got an eight out of 10 rating or a two out of 10 rating, you know? So it gives them very good insights. They call it guided discovery in CBT. Uh, very good insights as to what works for them and what doesn't work well for them. As a therapist though, the, uh, and uh, as uh, anybody in fact, it's interesting to refine, you see, you see if you look at the diary on the previous sheet, you'll say, well, look, they don't need to be watching television then, do they? Three out of 10, that's a low rating. Just urge them to stop watching television. Well, maybe, maybe not. It can work very well if people are into, if they've to built up the habit of TV watching, then what can work really well is to refine what you do. In other words, to say, well, maybe I'm watching the wrong TV programs. Maybe I'm watching the programs I used to like, but don't like anymore. And this can be literally transformational. And the slightest, slightest alteration, they're still watching television, but watching different programs. I mean, I'm uh, kind of slightly embarrassed to say that I used to love watching films, absolutely love it. You could watch one film after another, uh, you know, two hour films, three hour films, one after another, and would absolutely love it. Uh, I don't really like it half so much as I used to, uh, uh, used to do. Nowadays, quite like watching films, but I really like watching documentaries, uh, to my embarrassment. They say, well, you know, it's okay, documentaries are all right, and there's some really good documentaries about. And that change, though, is a really important one to know, because it can actually transfer, tra transform your mood. Sitting morosely in front of a film you're not enjoying can be quite a miserable activity, whereas watching another TV program, which you, which you do enjoy watching, can be thoroughly enjoyable. So it can be a small refinement that can produce a good uh, transformation. And the other thing is, I don't know, uh, do put in chat if you're wondering, you know, if you've, you've got any, idea, any ideas. We said it's not a good idea to spend ages watching, watching Fortnite. Uh, you know, why not? Seven out of 10, why isn't, why isn't it a good idea? Why won't it work? Uh, well, variety. Uh, we actually need variety. Now, Goethe, who, strangely enough, lived at exactly the same time as Jeremy Bentham, roughly from, 18, from uh, 1750 to 1830. Goethe said, variety, man can withstand anything except a succession of ordinary days. And I think by man, he was referring to, as it were, mankind, us, people, can withstand anything except a succession of ordinary days. We need a variety. I mean, I love... Uh, you know, going down to this particular Italian restaurant in Leicester, 
called San Carlo. I particularly love going down to San Carlo, sitting there, having a nice meal and having a drink and so on. I really like it. Would I like to spend all day, every day sitting there eating and drinking? No, not at all. It's uh, absolutely not. It's, uh, it it's works as in, in, in conjunction with other things. Uh, all right. Oh, just one last thing in this section, avoid overload. Even having lots of uh, too many, even wonderful things uh, really uh, don't work. I remember at one, one, one point I was seeing a lot of patients, very successful people uh, who were just having too many things to do. They're so successful. They were just asked to do this, that, the other. And uh, it just didn't really, they're simply overloaded. So it doesn't really matter whether you have too many good things to do or too many bad things to do. Overload or whatever sort uh, really results in depression because you, your system shuts down and says, look, I'm just opting out. I can't cope with it all. So I'm just uh, opting out. And either physically or mentally, the system shuts down. So if, you can't, if you can't organize your life better, then we're going to do it for you and shut you down. And I think that is it. That is it for this section. Um, so again, tick off the ones or uh, tick off the ones you do well, but make a note of the ones you want to work on. Decide on a meaning for your life. These are big things, aren't they? Decide on your values and principles and live by them. Find what you're good at. Do those things as well as you can and do those things lots. Head into them, do some things you enjoy and have some fun. Fantastic icing on the cake. Use a diary for insights and a list for inspiration. Maybe refine what you do. Nothing wrong with watching television, but are you watching the things that you like best? Have variety in your life and avoid overload. Right, right, right. Amy, what do you think? I think that's great. I've got a lot to work on. It's three o'clock. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe how fast that's gone. I know. What's I hate so it when we stop. Hmm? I hate it when we stop and everyone goes. <laughs> I know. And, well, we can have a Q&A. Shall we have a quick Q&A? Well, I suppose we could have a poll, couldn't we? I suppose that's what we should do. Yeah. So here we are. Here's, uh, um, I'm going to launch a poll. Um, I'm going to relaunch the poll. And I think in the list is Q&A. Oh, look. So yeah, final Q&A session. So if we have a Q&A session, then that, of course, finishes our, our session. Um, so, uh, which which is... Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Looks like a clear winner coming out. There is. Shall I press the button? Yeah, press the press the button. Okay. Are we done? We're done, but people went for Q and A. I'm sorry, Sue. Um, no, um, she's telling people not to go for the Q and A, so we stop. But. Um, yeah. Uh, Sorry, Sue. Well done, Sue. But Barry's kindly said that he likes this guy, so I'm assuming that's you, Will, so that's nice. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think guys guys is all inclusive, you know, so who knows? No, a guy, just G-U-Y. I know, but that can be anybody these days. Uh, um, so should we have a Q&A session? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop the share, and, and there we are. So no longer are we screen sharing, it's Q&A. So the, the score is then to write whatever questions you like in Q&A. Don't worry whether they're sensible questions, good questions and so on, because Amy is a past master in selecting, uh, selecting what are uh, questions that she judges um, uh, good questions to ask. And so she is, Amy is your representative. And I have to tell you, she loves asking difficult questions. So. I've got a good one because I think this is one of your favourites. Sean has asked, how important is sleep hygiene for stable mental health? Well, uh, sleep hygiene is important. It was necessary, but not sufficient. Um, it's just like any other hygiene thing. Yeah, uh, it's one of those things, if you have good hygiene, uh, good hygiene for yourself, people don't go around the place saying, oh, it's amazing, so-and-so has really good hygiene. 
Uh, but if you have bad hygiene, people do notice it. And they do go around the place saying that so-and-so has bad hygiene. Same thing with sleep hygiene. If you, uh, if you have your sleep hygiene factors okay, then it doesn't mean you sleep well, sadly. But if you don't have your sleep hygiene factors okay, it does mean you won't sleep well. If you've got your room all set up wrong and so forth. The, the key thing, I think, is in sleep to, to go, um, uh, we haven't covered it, have we? But if you, if you go on the web and search for CBT for insomnia, that, that brings you up some very good things. And if you were to say, well, what is the best single thing from CBT for insomnia? I'd suggest to you it is to keep a diary of what happens when you, when you go to bed and sleep. And it's a, it's a diary full of, um, full of facts, like data. So for example, you will, you will say, um, uh, I had one hour sleep uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, I went to bed at um, half past 10 at night uh, and woke up at 3 a.m. I was full of energy, felt like getting up and doing all sorts of good things, uh, but I made myself lie in bed from 3 a.m. until 6 a.m. Uh, when I went to sleep again, I went back to sleep again about 6 a.m. Then the alarm went at 7 a.m. and I had to get up and it woke me up and I was really tired and very lethargic and felt as though I had a terrible night. Now, if you keep a diary like that, then you can make, um, you can really investigate your sleep. And this is what a therapist would do with you if you went for a CBT for insomnia. They would look at the data and say, well, I wonder what would happen if you hadn't have had that one hour sleep in the afternoon. So we experiment and not have uh, the one hour sleep. I wonder what would happen if you went to bed at uh, 11.30 instead of 10.30. I wonder if that would be better or worse. Uh, and so on. They, and you can really get good data about your sleeping. It doesn't alter the fact that you know, if, you, if you lie in your bed all day uh, with uh, you know, playing computer games or doing your emails and so on, that's a bad idea. That ruins your sleep hygiene. So it's a good idea to keep a diary like that. It's a very good idea to, um, uh, to have regular you know, times in the circadian rhythm as in sleep hygiene, that's a very good idea. Um, uh, but really, keep the diary. Super, thank you. So we've got a lot of good questions coming in. Um, what if something's out of your control, such as dealing with grief? Oh, yes. Well, dealing with grief is um, it's one of those things that when, you, when you're grieving, there's really nothing that anybody can do. And the only consolation is that, yeah, who would have it any other way? Because it is the, it's the flip side of having had a really good relationship, typically. Not always, but typically it's the flip side of having had a very good relationship. So what, if we're not gonna have grief, we're not gonna have good relationships. So it is unfortunately the, the flip side of that. And the, the trite thing that people say is that time is a great healer. And it is trite, but it's also true. And in, in time, what happens is you learn to fill the hole that is, that is left by the, uh, by the person you're grieving for or the relationship you're grieving for. You do learn to, to fill that hole. And you even learn in time to look back on, uh, uh, on, the, on the times you had with the, the person you're missing and uh, look back with, with humor and enjoyment and uh, you know, relish, relish those, those times, you know? So, um, I'm afraid it is a question of time. Oh, just one other thing, actually. If it is brief, um, there are some very good self-help organizations about, like, crews you get some very good feedback on. Uh, but if you look for self-help organizations as grief, it is, you will find it very supportive to be with others who are in the same boat. Um, okay, okay, what would you um, say to a client who says they haven't got time to do all of these things? Uh, prioritize. You don't have to do them all. Uh, there's, we've covered loads of things and there's things we haven't covered as well. Uh, and the good news is you don't have to do them all. Uh, just do uh, the ones that hit you, hit you as priority. Do the ones you fancy doing. Um, yeah, that. Oh. Uh, all right, one for to keep you on this on your toes. Uh, what would be your number one question for you to ask a client to identify what would be the best solution for them? Uh, best solution for them. Um, 
Well, without asking the person what they mean by solution, for it, whether it's a solution to a particular problem or a particular way forward, um, that's a very good question, isn't it? One question to ask people is, um, is so well, let's just brainstorm one or two questions. One would be, where would you like to be in six months' time? What would you like to have achieved in six months' time? Because that gets at people's goals, and uh, the more the more clearly we have uh, their goals in mind is, is great, but equally, the more clearly they have their goals in mind is great too. I prefer I prefer talking about people's goals than than their problems, but goals and problems are both relevant, and a lot of people's goals are to get rid of their problems. So to get a clear to get a clear handle on their goals, I think would be the thing. Any question that gets to that. Super. Um, what is your favourite self help book to read or recommend to clients? What do you think? Am I allowed to uh, do some? Oh, uh, do a shameless plug. Okay. Well, I have to tell you um, uh, a short story here that uh, my. Uh, well, one of my daughters is a uh, psychiatrist, and when she was training, her consultant psychiatrist said to her, there's only two books you need. Uh, I forget what one of them was. The second one, though, was Overcoming Irritability and Anger by William Davis. And so uh, uh, my daughter said, no, it's my dad. <laughs> no, good. have you read it then? She said, no. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, the great thing about irritability and anger is it can be caused by all sorts of things. So, and uh, it's, uh, it's, so you have to be, uh, you have to know about quite a lot in order to deal with irritability and anger. It can be caused by you know, PTSD, for example. It can be caused by just depression, anxiety, it can be caused by all sorts of things. So you have to know things across the board for that. So for one self-help book, I would go for that. Uh, second self-help book, I don't know really. I don't know. No, I can't. I can't honestly think of a. a, a, a um, well, no, I can. That overcoming series, actually, of which mine is is one of the series. That is a very good series. So overcoming anxiety, overcoming depression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, whichever title takes your fancy, you know you're going to get a good book there. Um, so just a couple of people are asking what the title. It's overcoming. Is it anger and irritability or irritability and anger? I can remember. Uh, I think it's anger and irritability, actually, isn't it? Overcoming anger and irritability, yeah. yeah. Um, and last one, um, will you be doing another session to cover the sessions that you haven't done today? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, the answer is I don't know. Um, uh, well, the, the real answer is I'll talk to Amy about it and see what we think. Um, it's been it's been a wonderful turnout, actually, everybody. Thank mm -hmm. you. This is Christmas week. This is the day before Christmas Eve. So we kind of ha half expected no one to turn up. So uh, we're very encouraged by the number of people who have arrived. So uh, thank you for that. So possibly that will encourage us to repeat. It. Um, it is lovely to do these free webinars, I think. Um, so if we possibly can, it, it does, um, yeah. What do you think? Everyone's saying yes, please. Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's nice. nice. <laughs> um, so um, I think on that note, is it a kind of Merry Christmas? Yeah. You know, are you going to put the music on? Shall I put the music on just a second? Yeah, you say that like it's an easy thing to do. <laughs> no, I didn't mean straight away. I didn't mean straight away. We can. No. Um, if, if people want to, if people want to ask uh, questions in Q in um, chat, they can. We can. We can leave that running for. Quarter an hour, half an hour? Yeah, of course. There's some lovely comments in chat and help and good book recommendations and all sorts if anyone wants to read through the chat. It's lovely. Great. Great. Lovely to see you all again. I'll um, leave you well, but uh, Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, thanks, Amy, very much. Thanks, Amy, for being, uh, being the team. And uh, bye, everybody, and happy Christmas, and keep yourself well, and see you next year, hopefully. Bye then. Ladies.